This week on Vaticano, learn about the new saints finally canonized after two years of pandemic and discover the miracle that prompted Charles de Foucault to be officially recognized as a saint. Meet a family on a mission. And during this Marian month of May, discover with us the oldest image of Our Lady. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. On May the 15th, Pope Francis canonized 10 new saints, a mixture of priests, religious, and laity from France, Italy, the Netherlands, and India. Blessed Lazarus was born in the south of India in 1712. Known by the name of Deva Sahaya, he was born into a Hindu family of superior caste. Thanks to his formation and intelligence, he achieved the position of official in the court of the King of Travancore. After his conversion to Christianity, a group of soldiers of the crown assassinated him because of his faith. Blessed Caesar de Bus was born into a noble and deeply Christian family in 1544 in a small town in French Provence. At 18 years of age, he began an unsuccessful military career. When he returned home, his father died and he took on the management of the family patrimony. Years went by, and young Caesar let himself be carried away by the mundane life of the court and high society, but without giving up his attention for the least and those less fortunate. In 1575, at 31 years old, Caesar radically changed his life and converted to Christianity. He was ordained a priest and founded the Congregation of the Fathers of Christian Doctrine. Blessed Luigi Maria Palazzolo was born in the Italian city of Bergamo in 1827. The last of nine children, the young Luigi distinguished himself from a very young age for his discipline in his studies, his profound faith, and his attention to those who suffered. After his ordination to the priesthood, he carried out numerous initiatives of charity and spiritual formation, devoted mainly to young people and those most in need. Along the course of his life, he would found the Congregation of the Sisters of the Poor and the Brothers of the Holy Family. Blessed Giustino Maria Russo Lillo was born in the Italian province of Naples in 1891. The third of 10 siblings, from a very young age, he demonstrated great piety. At five years old, he received his first communion. At 10, he entered the seminary, and at just 22 years of age, he was ordained a priest. Along the course of his life, he would give life to the Society of Divine Vocations and the community of the Vocationist Sisters. Blessed Charles de Foucault was born in France in 1858 into a Christian family. At six years of age, he was orphaned and along with his sister went to live with his maternal grandfather. During his adolescence, he lost the faith and led a worldly life, but that didn't extinguish the flame. At 28 years of age, after a trip to Morocco and the discovery of Islam, and as a result of hard discernment, Charles recovered his faith, confessed and received the Eucharist. After years of preparation, finally in 1901, he was ordained a priest and took off for the north of Africa. The final stage of his life was spent in the heart of the Sahara with the Tuareg people, where as a poor man among the poor, he would make the salvation of men the only objective of his life. In 1916, he was murdered at the age of 58. Blessed Maria Francesca of Jesus was born in the province of Turin in 1854. From a very young age, she dedicated her days to works of charity, to catechesis, and to the care of the sick and those most in need. At 40 years of age, her parish priests guided her to a religious reality that was being established in that moment in the Institute of the Capuchin Sisters of Luano, today known as the Capuchin Sisters of Mother Rubato, after her. From that moment, she would dedicate her life to the service of the most in need and the evangelization of all peoples. Blessed Maria Domenica Mantovani was born into a poor and deeply Christian family in the Italian province of Verona in 1862. At 24 years of age, she made a vow of perpetual virginity before her spiritual director and parish priest, with whom later on she would found the Congregation of the Little Sisters of the Holy Family. Blessed Titus Bransma was born in the Netherlands in 1881. From a very young age, he felt the vocation to the religious life growing within him. Due to his poor health, he was not admitted to the Franciscan order and finally found his place in the Carmelite order. At the age of 24, he was ordained a priest and after a period of studies in Rome, he returned to Holland where the shadow of Nazism was beginning to work itself into all areas of society. 
Titus began a campaign against the horrors of the National Socialist regime and traveled throughout the country, visiting the editorial offices of Catholic newspapers, inviting them to resist the pressures of the Nazi regime. In January of 1942, he was arrested, and after months of imprisonment, in June, he was sent to the Dachau concentration camp, where on July the 26th, he was killed by lethal injection. Blessed Marie Rivière was born in France in 1768. At 16 months old, she fell out of bed and was paralyzed until the age of nine, when she miraculously recovered. From that moment on, she promised to dedicate her life to the care of the little ones, the young and the marginalized. Due to health problems, she was not admitted to religious life until 1796, when, with the permission of her bishop, she founded the Congregation of the Sisters of the Presentation of Mary. Blessed Carolina Santo Canale was born in Palermo, Italy in 1852. She grew up in a Christian family of high society. At the age of 19, she confided to her parents her desire to consecrate herself to God, news that her father never accepted. For Carolina, the ideal of the consecrated life was the cloister. But aware of the need for the assistance and instruction of her companions, she decided to dedicate her life to the poor, the sick, and women. In 1910, Sister Maria of Jesus founded the Capuchin Sisters of the Immaculate of Lourdes, dedicating her life to works of charity. Hello, and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. Pope Francis met the president of the Swiss Confederation, Ignazio Cassis, before the solemn swearing-in of 36 new recruits for the Pontifical Swiss Guards. The swearing-in of the new Swiss Guards takes place every year on May 6, the anniversary of the day 189 guards fought to save the life of Pope Clement VII during the sack of Rome. Every year, the Swiss Guards commemorate the 147 guards who lost their lives defending the Pope. Pope Francis, in a message for the World Day of Prayer for Vocations, addressed the meaning of vocation in the context of a synodal church. The Pope stressed that everyone has a vocation, even those who are not called to the priesthood. The Prime Minister of Japan, Fumio Kishida, met with Pope Francis and other Vatican officials. He spoke about his concern for China's actions in the South China Sea and the human rights situation in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. In an address to members of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, Pope Francis said the barbarity of war should inspire a new push for Christian unity. When a community tries to go it alone, he said, it runs the risk of self-sufficiency and self-referentiality, which are grave obstacles to ecumenism. Pope Francis has warned against exploiting the liturgy for one's own ideologies. He said it is not possible to worship God and at the same time make the liturgy a battleground for specific topics. Liturgy should lead to greater ecclesial unity in life and study, not division, he said. Thank you for watching this week's Vaticano Updates. I'm Hannah Brockhaus for EWTN Vaticano. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. Just outside the center of Rome in Tre Fontane, there's almost nothing to remind us of the heat and loneliness of the Sahara the largest desert in the world. And yet there's still footprints to be seen here of the desert saint, Charles de Foucault. We're here in a beautiful oasis in the heart of Rome. This is the monastery of the Little Sisters of Jesus, an order inspired by Charles de Foucault. And here receiving us is Father Andrea, who is the vice postulator. In order for the Taureg to learn to invoke God, he created this rosary, where instead of the Our Father, he would say, My God, I love you with all my heart, with all my being. 
and then for the small beads instead of the Hail Mary. He used the names of Jesus according to Muslim tradition. Father Andrea Mandonico wrote a biography about Charles de Foucault. He tells how young Charles had lost his faith and yet found his way back to God. This man was a true seeker of God. He did not settle for what others said, lowered himself even though he did not believe, and spent hours in church saying, O oh God, if you exist, make yourself known. Father Andrea emphasized that Charles de Foucault did not die as a classic martyr, although he was murdered in the Sahara on December the 1st, 1916. He says of all Muslims, Christians, idolaters, Jews, all I must find in me a brother who cares for them, the safe friend to trust. Why was he killed? First, he was not killed by the Tauregs he knew. He was killed by the Sunuzi, who came from Libya and had heard that there were weapons in his house, which the French army had entrusted them to defend themselves. And so they came in trying to steal, because they entrusted him to the custody of a young man, a 15, 16 years old, who got scared. And so they shot him in the head. But he wasn't considered by the church to be a martyr, because he wasn't killed in Odium Fidei. It was during a robbery at his home. Years after his death, Charles de Foucault was venerated by many believers. The man who had never founded a monastery himself served as an inspiration to other founders of religious orders. Cardinal Marcello Semerado, the prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, tries to explain this fascination for Foucault. Charles de Foucault was in a situation where perhaps someone would have asked him, but who is he making you do this? Why are you doing this? Is it worth it? Aren't there so many other bigger problems? Aren't there so many more important situations in which you can intervene? Instead, he chose to put himself on the side of these people and lost his life, not sick in it, but he's a victim. Martyrdom is not something to seek after. The church does not recognize martyrs who seek it, but recognizes martyrs, those who suffer it. That is, they suffer martyrdom. However, they make you see that there is something more important. In Italian, we would say, ne vale la pena. It is worth it. The miracle that finally led to the canonization of Charles de Foucault is not a classic cure, but belongs to the category of protection in a danger. It's an accident that occurred in the city of Saumur, France, the city where Charles de Foucault had received his military training. There's a chapel there, which is still the only one outside the Diocese of Angers, dedicated to Blessed Charles de Foucault. On November the 30th, 2016, during renovation work on that chapel, a 21-year-old carpenter fell 15.5 meters and narrowly escaped death. The name of this fallen carpenter also happens to be Charles. His boss, Francois Asseline, remembers. He fell on the post of the pew, a piece of wood almost two inches long. This piece of wood went through his abdomen, under his heart, and went out of his back. The wood pierced right through him. The French carpenter was not baptized, nor did he know who Charles de Foucault was. Francois Asseline tells us that his wife started praying immediately and also informed the local parish priest, who remembered that the next day, December the 1st, 2016, was the 100th anniversary of Charles de Foucault's death. Francois visited his injured co-worker several times in the hospital, even bringing him comic books about blessed Charles de Foucault. He could have died 10 times. He arrived on the operating table and everything went well. No vital organ had been touched, no after effects, neither cerebral nor physical. This may also be the first known WhatsApp miracle. Thanks to Francois's wife, 
who used the messenger service to inform the parish priest, triggering a storm of prayer to Charles de Foucault, who was still a blessed at that time. With Foucault, Catholics worldwide now have a saint who can still serve as a role model today. Time will show what miracles the saint will continue to work, even today, in the deserts of solitude in our society. Imagine having four children with your husband or wife. Now imagine adding 27 students into your home and living in the center of Rome. For some, this would be a recipe for chaos. But for the Asafs, this blend has become a vocation and a ministry. Nestled in a quiet corner of Rome, amidst the surrounding chaos, Andrea and Tony Asaf live in a villa with their family and students. This is the campus of Roots in Rome, which is our family's company for pilgrimages and for student uh, programs. They mainly study art and architecture, humanities, and they live here with us. So right now we have 27 students living with us for a semester. Here we go uh, past the patron saint of the villa. This is Saint Anthony of Padua. So here we have uh, our youngest two children. This is Cordelia, who is five, and this is Valentina, who is nine. Over there we've got Joseph, he is 14, and then the sister of one of our students who's visiting for Holy Week. And over here we will have one of the busiest rooms of the house, where you almost always find my husband. Hey guys, come on in. Welcome. This is where we cook. We're starting here, we're preparing the famous Lebanese baba ghanoush with the eggplant. Chopping for the salad, prepping for the shawarma, and this is the famous tomb from Lebanon, which is the garlic paste. Right here we're gonna put it with the meat. The students will be here for lunch in a little bit. Here we go. We asked Andrea and Tony Asaf how this decision to welcome so many students came about. I'm not sure we decided it. I think uh, it evolved as a mission, definitely. And because it's a mission, it has lots of sacrifices. Sacrifice of privacy, of order, things like that. We have so many people coming and going all the time, but it's an extremely enriching way to live as well. We meet so many people and bond with them every few months and then a new group. And every time we have a new group come, we uh, are enriched by their personalities, their experiences, and we get to see Rome new through their eyes. I think that's the most rewarding part of living with all these strangers. We then asked some of the students living with the Asaf family what their experience has been and how being welcomed by a family has enriched their time in the Eternal City. It's actually a little bit like being back home because I have little siblings. So I've loved being around, I love and am comfortable with being around little children. So playing with the little Asaf girls and talking with them is, it's like being back home. It's very relaxing. A family is, you know, a mini church, right? And then every, I think, this has made me realize that every family has its own vocation. You know, you have your individual vocation as a person and this, I didn't see it before, but truly every family is called to something different. And for them, it's housing students and helping them to experience Rome. You know, we're so close. I mean, you can look at St. Peter's. I remember Mr. Soft saying in orientation, he's saying, when you go out on a weekend trip and you've stayed maybe two nights somewhere, and you're exhausted from touring or something like that, you will say to yourself, I want to come home. And it's true, I realized it. I was, I was in the train at 10.30 at night and I realized, I, I was just saying to myself, I can't wait to come home. And the Asafs have been a crucial part in making me feel at home. Looking ahead to the World Meeting of Families, which will be taking place in Rome this June, and which will be the largest gathering of Catholic families in the world, we asked Tony and Andrea 
what message they would have for Catholic families. I think a lot of people today, when they think of family, they think only of the nuclear family. And I've found that that can be suffocating for families, that they have to be completely self-sufficient. The way that I was raised with my parents, we had people coming and going. We had refugees live with us from Ethiopia, Yugoslavia, uh, Vietnam. I think that that broadened my horizons and it made me want to provide that lifestyle for my family as well. That the more people we meet and invite into our home through hospitality, through the mission of hospitality, the greater our family is enriched. It's difficult, for sure, for all of those reasons that I mentioned, but by exercising uh, hospitality as a family, we are evangelizing ourselves through evangelizing others. We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. With the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God acquired a human face. We all know the face of Jesus and his physical features very precisely. From the first centuries, Jesus' face was depicted and represented in a similar way to the images and icons of today. However, the image of his mother, the Virgin Mary, hasn't acquired fixed physical features. In different countries, she's represented with different faces, and in every apparition, she even appears differently. In Fatima, Our Lady looks like a Portuguese. In Guadalupe, Mexico, she appeared as an indigenous on the tilma of St. Juan Diego. As at the apparitions in Cabejo, Rwanda, her skin is dark. The question arises then, if Our Lady is an historical person who has been taken into heaven, body and soul, why don't we know her original face? It's such an interesting question. Let's explore this question with the help of art, history, and theology. But first, with art historian Liz Lev, let's look up the oldest image of Our Lady. The oldest image we have of the Blessed Virgin is not a portrait. It's not as an icon would be. The oldest image we have in the world is a Madonna and Child in the Catacombs of Priscilla, where we see a very stylized face, but we already understand something about how she will always be presented. She's a very large figure holding the very small child who turns around to look at you. So we see her already in her sort of physical role as the throne or the the ark. I mean, we already can understand that the artists are trying to show this, this, this connection between the mother and son. The image of the Virgin Mary at the Roman catacombs of Priscilla illustrates the devotion of the first Christians to the mother of God and reveals an influence on how she would be depicted in the future. I think um, the question of a canonical image of the Blessed Virgin is, is an interesting one because in, in sort of the, the automatic mind that people who study Western art, oh, the Madonna and Child, we think to a Raphael image or a Leonardo image. But actually, um, there is uh, the, the only thing that really is canonical, if you will, in an image of the Madonna is that there's usually a way that she is pointing towards her son. It's unusual to find an image of Mary alone. There are a few, but generally the images of Mary are images of Mary who are who is pointing towards her son or in the few cases where she's indicating upwards to draw our eyes towards heaven. So I think the most canonical aspect of understanding a vision of Mary is that Mary is always going to, def she, she looks at you, she engages you, but then she deflects you to her son. So it's sort of like uh, uh, that moment when she says at the wedding of Cana, do whatever he tells you. And that's kind of our connection with her so that she can say, do whatever he tells you. In the Christian East, it's commonly believed that St. Luke the Evangelist made the first image of the Virgin Mary, 
and that all the icons take their roots from that so-called proto-image or first image. There are many types of icons, however. They're classified into five broad groups with Greek names. Agiosuritissa, Our Lady that intercedes. Oranta, Mother of God represented in prayer. Eliusa represents Our Lady's tenderness and affection to Jesus. Panakranta, meaning all merciful, and the Virgin Mary is represented on a throne with heavenly glory. Odigitria, Mary who shows the way to Jesus. To find out which type of icon is closest to the first representation of Our Lady by St. Luke, we ask EWTN journalist and relic hunter Paul Bade. When I lived in Jerusalem, I was shown an icon in the old city, in the so-called House of St. Mark, which we were told was created by Luke. I took a photo of it and showed it to the most famous Polish icon painter of that time. This is the present abbot, Bernard Maria Alter, the present abbot of the Dormition Abbey of the Benedictines in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. He is the greatest expert in Poland. He said, ah, the icon of Luke, but I think it is from the 6th century AD. The authentic icon by Luke is not here though. It is in Rome, so you'll have to look for it there. So then we went from Jerusalem to Rome to look for it, but nobody here knew of it. Nobody knew her, and we discovered her by chance after many years. In the next episode of Vaticano, we'll continue the search for the true face of Our Lady. Stay with us.